Well, good morning. Thank you for braving the weather and coming and being present. And hello to those really braving the weather out on the courtyard and those that are at home. We're so glad to have you all here this morning. I'm sure we've got some people in the room that love memorizing scripture. So I'm going to ask for a couple and see, see if you know the verses that I'm asking for. Can anyone quote Romans 3.23? Shout it out. Yep, there it is. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Correct. Well done. <sighs> that truth, though. Stop and think about it. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Nobody is perfect. We've all made mistakes. In fact, the verse right before it, part of that phrase, it says, there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no distinction. No one's different. All of us have sinned. And yet we're afraid to talk about those mistakes, those sins. A huge part of the fear is what will happen once your mistake is discovered? What are people going to think of me? What consequences or discipline am I going to face? How are people going to act once they know? The beauty of the gospel is that God's view of us never changes. God knows everything. God is intimately involved with our lives. He sees all the mistakes that we make and he desires a relationship with us. He sees all the sins that I've done wrong and he wants a relationship with me? What? But yes, that's the gospel. And he loves us so much that he sent his one and only son down to this earth to communicate that love to us. And then he dies on a cross because that's the penalty that you deserve, that I deserve, is death, separation from him. He gets up on the cross, he dies, and he doesn't stay dead because he is God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. He rises from the dead, showing his power over sin, over death, and invites us into relationship with him. That is the gospel, and that's what we're about here. If this is your first time here, that's what we preach every Sunday. That's what we want for you, is to have a relationship with Jesus, is to recognize your own depravity, your need for a savior, and to give your life over to him. Christ takes the punishment that you deserve, that I deserve. Today we're going to be taking communion, which is just a reminder of that. It's a representation of Jesus' body in the cracker, a representation of his blood and the juice. And it points us back to the sacrifice that he made for us. Now, of course, once you come to Christ, everything is sunshine and rainbows, as we see from outside today. Of course not. Because we continue to fail. We continue to make mistakes, even as Christians, even as we're walking in our relationship with Christ. It says in Romans 7, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil is right there with me. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? When Paul concludes, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We wrestle back and forth with sin. But God enters into our lives, is present in our lives, and offers us forgiveness time after time after time. Here's another verse. Can anyone quote 1 John 1, 9? If we confess, there it is. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. 
He offers us forgiveness and he's always with us. Romans 8, 38, 39, for I am convinced that neither, there it is, death nor life, angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation that includes myself will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the gospel. That's the beauty of it. He continues to pursue us. He continues to stay present in our lives. Even when we blow it, even when we make mistakes, he's there and he's present. There's nothing that can separate us from his love. And this is exactly what we see in today's passage. I would invite you to open your Bibles up to Genesis chapter 29. Genesis 29, we're continuing our series looking at the lives of Isaac and Jacob, and Jacob's our main character this morning. But we're going to start with a little bit of context. Because no context can make you more sympathetic to Jacob than you should be. And no context can cause you to miss the point why this was written down. Now, before we dive into our passage, we need to, to look back. If you watch some different TV series, you know, you have previously on whatever series. So right now we're doing previously in the Bible. So we're going to go back and look just a little bit and remind ourselves of Jacob's life. Jacob was prophesied to rule over his brother. And whether he knew that or not, he definitely acted on it. He starts out by taking his brother's birthright via deception. Oh, you want some stew? Okay, give me your birthright. And then he takes his brother's blessing via deception at the suggestion of his mother. And Rebecca definitely knew God's prophecy. He told it to her directly. The older will serve the younger. And then after he deceives Isaac, takes Esau's birthright, Esau gets mad and wants to kill Jacob. So Jacob takes off at the suggestion of his mother and takes off to Haran. And on his way, which is the passage we talked about last week, he has this significant encounter with God through a dream. And in this significant encounter, he makes a promise to God to be devoted to him and to give him a tenth of everything. And God also makes a promise to Jacob. He starts out by reiterating the promise that he's made to Abraham, to Isaac. I'll bless you. I'll make you into a great nation. I'll give you this land. And then he says in verse 15 of chapter 28, he says, behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. I'm with you. I'll bring you back. I will not leave you until I've done what I've promised you. In fact, that's our title this morning. I am with you. I am with you. And this promise that God gives is unconditional. He doesn't say, I am with you if. He just says, I'm with you. I'm going to fulfill my promise that I made to you. God promises that he will follow through. And he does just like he always does. We just sang it. All your promises are yes and amen. God makes a promise. He follows through every single time. Not once has he not fallen, followed through, there it is, on a promise that he makes. God always follows through. And it's this context that shapes how we read today's passage. We're gonna keep coming back to this promise. I am with you, I am with you, I am with you. Because Jacob makes some mistakes. Some that are directly here in this passage, some that he made before and will be brought back up. And through it all, God is with Jacob. 
And the same is true of us. We make mistakes and God is continually present. He never gives up on us. He's always with us. And so now, Genesis chapter 29. We begin in verse one. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. This morning, we're going to look at three times that God is with you that aren't necessarily as glamorous. And the first is that God is with you when you wander. God is with you when you wander. See, we read this first verse and we're told he, he comes to the land of the people of the east. Oh, that's nice. I can draw a little map, get some GPS directions, you know. Oh, that's fantastic. No, no, no. You need to know if you look through Genesis, whenever the east comes up, this is one of those things like the mood changes. Time to switch to a minor key. Bum, bum, bum. The east. The east carries with it a negative connotation. When Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden, God sends them to the east. It says that an angel comes and guards the entrance of the garden from the east because that's where they were sent. You can't come back into the Garden of Eden. They were sent out to the east. After Cain kills Abel, he runs away to the east. When Abraham and Lot are up and choosing different lands, different places to go, Lot chooses the land to the east, which includes Sodom and Gomorrah, which is eventually destroyed. And Abraham sends away the sons of his concubines to the east. And so when we see this here, it's important to know that this is a mood change. Jacob came to the east. He's in a place he's not supposed to be. This is not a good direction for him. Bum, bum, bum. Now, why is Jacob headed this way? Why is he going this direction? Well, he's following his mother's advice. And how good has his mother's advice been so far? Well, if we go back and look at the story of Rebecca, Rebecca started out great. Here she, she waters all these camels and she heads off into a land that's unknown to her because she knows she's supposed to go and she's following after God. Isn't that great? Go, Rebecca! And then she's barren for 20 years. All she wants is kids. And for 20 years, she deals with infertility. And then she finally gets pregnant and it's a difficult and tumultuous pregnancy. She says, why is this happening to me? Her boys are born and she loves Jacob. And then the family heads off to another land and Isaac lies about Rebecca to the people there. Oh, she's my sister. Couldn't have been good for Rebecca. Probably didn't feel great for her with him saying that. And so Rebecca's got this tumultuous past and she hears that there's this blessing. Isaac's gonna give the blessing and she remembers, oh yeah, that's right. God said, the older's gonna serve the younger. Jacob, get in there, take the blessing. That's, uh, that's where we're at. And then after that, Esau wants to kill Jacob. And so Rebecca says, head to the land of the east. This is why Jacob's here. You see, he's not supposed to be here. Why else is he here? Well, he's afraid of his brother. His, my brother's gonna kill me. What just happened right before this? Jacob has this beautiful, amazing experience with God. 
this mountaintop experience where God shows up and promises to always be with him. And Jacob's like, yes, Lord, I'm following you. That's it. I'm giving you a tenth of everything. But I'm still going to run away because that guy's going to try to kill me. <laughs> Come on, Jacob. Come on. You had this amazing experience and you're afraid and you're running away. But don't we do the same? We have an amazing quiet time with the Lord or we show up and a, a song hits us or a sermon hits us and, oh, yes, Lord, I'm following after you. We go to some conference. Yes, Lord. And then Monday comes and we go right back to our same routines that we always do. We wander. So is God still present with Jacob? Jacob. When Jacob's headed in a direction he shouldn't be. Does God stay with us when we wander? Yes, Lord, I'm following you, but I'm actually kind of afraid I'm going to go over here. Look at Psalm 139 on the screen. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day for darkness is as light with you. It doesn't matter where you go. God is with you doesn't matter. You can almost hear like frustration in the psalmist's voice. <sighs> Go to heaven. You're there. Hell, you're there. Uttermost parts of the sea. Yep, you're there too. God is always with us. There's a phrase that as Christians, we tend to use from time to time, and I'm guilty of it too. And I've been thinking about it a lot recently. God showed up. Oh, in this one circumstance, God showed up. I get the sentiment behind it, right? That here we're having this experience or whatever, and all of a sudden we recognize and see or feel the presence of God. But if you just think about the phrase, God showed up, it can carry this idea that he wasn't there before. Right, if you're all hanging out and someone shows up late, walks in late, oh, look who showed up, because they weren't there before. God showed up. Could very well put in our heads that he's not always there. And that's absolutely not the case. God is always present. God is always with us. Yeah, but, but where was God when we had our miscarriage? Where was God when all this injustice happened? Where was God when my friend passed away? I just did my friend's memorial service last week. He was my best friend in high school, passed away way too early. Where was God? God was there. God enters in to our pains and is present through those. He holds our hand and walks with us. Sometimes he... He's with us. And even though my friend that I did the memorial service for spent some time wandering, spent some time where he proudly declared himself an atheist. God didn't leave. God was present. God continued to show up in his life. God continued to come after him, brought him back to himself. I got to lead him to the Lord a few years ago, and I know that he's celebrating with Jesus today. God never gives up on you. God is with you when you wander. I carry in my pocket a little wooden cross everywhere with me. 
Because wouldn't you know it, I need reminders that God is always with me. I need reminders. We all do. Because sure, even those of us that have been walking with Jesus for a long time, of course God is always with me. But we don't act that way. Oh, I need to take control of this situation. Oh, I feel absolutely terrified. I feel all alone. Hello, God of the universe with you constantly. And so I carry this in my pocket to remind me as I'm stepping into something where I'm a little bit nervous, have a little bit of fear, not confident in what's going to happen next. You're with me. God is with you when you wander. All right, we're one verse in. We've got some work to do. (laughs) Back to Genesis 29, verse two. As Jacob looked, he saw a well in the field and behold, three flocks of sheep lying beside it. For out of that well, the flocks were watered. The stone on the well's mouth was large and when all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep and put the stone back in its place over the mouth of the well. Jacob said to them, my brothers, where do you come from? They said, we are from Haran. He said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? They said, we know him. He said to them, it is, is it well with him? They said, it is well. See, Rachel, his daughter is coming with the sheep. He said, Behold, it is still high day. It is not time for the livestock to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go, pasture them. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and the stone is rolled from the mouth of the well. Then we water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came from her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. Now, as soon as Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his brother's mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob came near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman and and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. As soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Jacob told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. Second thing we see here, God is with you when you are arrogant. God is with you when you are arrogant. Now let's understand this just a little bit more. Jacob shows up at a well. This isn't the first time as we've been reading through the book of Genesis that we've had some interaction at a well. In fact, the last one was around Jacob's parents. And I'm sure as Jacob grew up, he was told the story of how his parents got together. His grandfather, Abraham, sent a servant out back to his home country to this same area to a well and came back with Rebecca. And then Rebecca and Isaac got married. So Jacob grew up knowing this. And he comes to a well, possibly even the same well. We don't know, but another well, same area, and he shows up and he's like, God promised that he would make me into a great nation. It's wife time. Like, I'm here at a well. I'm going to find me a wife. This is what's happening. I'm pumped and I'm excited. Here we go. It's very intentional that we have two well experiences, that the author put both of those in, that we have both of those in scripture, because We need to compare and contrast. We have two well experiences, but there's some things that happen that are very different. First of all, Abraham's servant, when he was sent to the well, he was following God. Abraham says to him, the Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred and who spoke to me and swore to me to your offspring, I will give this land. He will send his angel before you and you shall take a wife for my son from there. 
And then the servant replies, he says, O oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. As Abraham's servant is heading out, he is following God. Jacob is there because he is following his mother who has already pointed him in the wrong direction. Now you heard this over and over, Laban, his mother's brother, Laban, his mother's brother, over and over. This is his sister's son, his mother, Rebecca, over and over. It keeps coming back to who this guy is and who he's connected to because we're supposed to be drawn into the fact that he's here because he's following Rebecca. He's following bad advice and that's why he's here. First contrast there, following God, following his mother. Second thing that we see that's different, Abraham's servant, when he shows up at the well, he waits by the well for a sign from God. Whereas Jacob jumps in and acts. In Genesis 24, it says, before he had finished speaking, talking about the servant, Rebecca shows up, he asks her for a drink, and he waits as she voluntarily waters his camels. In contrast, we have Jacob, it, it says in verse 9 of our passage, while he was still speaking with them, that's intended to be so similar to draw you back. Okay, these two are connected. We're supposed to pay attention to how these stories are connected. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel shows up, and what does Jacob do? He jumps into action. Hey, this is how my mom and dad wound up together. Now it's my turn. Here we go. It's wife time. And whether it's supernatural strength that's given to him or just the adrenaline and excitement of a beautiful girl, he takes the stone and shoves it off and waters all her sheep. Bam, here we go. Then he kisses her with a kiss of greeting, just like the one that Laban gives him two verses later. And he weeps for joy and he tells her who he is. And in all of that, Jacob's basically jumping in and saying, God, <laughs> I've got this. I've got this covered, God. I know that you promised that you're gonna make me into this great nation. I saw what you did with my parents. So obviously you're doing the same thing right now. So I'm gonna jump in and I'm gonna make sure that this happens the way that I want it to. Just like when his mother knew what God's plan was, saw a way to make it happen and acted, Jacob did the same thing. He knew God's promise, saw an opportunity and acted. And we do the same thing. Whether it's in our career, in our relationships, in the direction of our life. God, you're not acting fast enough. So I'm going to step in and take over. God, you're headed in the direction that, that, that I don't like very much. So I'm actually going to go this way instead. God, I've got this. And we walk with this arrogance of, of course I know God's going to have me go over here. Because that's easier and that's more comfortable and it just makes more sense to me. Yeah, I know I kind of feel him tugging me this direction, but I'm going to go over here. Obviously. And we take over and we stop listening to God and we put ourselves in charge. Many of you that interacted with the week of prayer started off in Psalm 46. Psalm 46 says, the nations rage, the kingdoms totter. God utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. And then later it says, be still and know that I am God. We see God's presence through Jacob's narrative, both before this and after. God is with Jacob as he's being arrogant. Jacob isn't trusting God's timing, so he is taking control. And God is with us when we are being arrogant as well. So the challenge is to trust him more, to put down your arrogance and to trust what God is doing. Be still and know that I am God. 
God's on the throne. God's got a plan. God knows what he's doing. So even if it doesn't make sense, put down your arrogance and say, okay, God, I trust you. Even when everyone around me is telling me, this doesn't make sense, you should go the other direction. No, God instructed me to head this way. I need to walk in this direction. I need to do what he's told me to do. Sometimes it is sitting and waiting. Sometimes it's taking action. But you better be sure that you're heading in the direction that God is pointing you, not in the direction that just makes sense to you. So God is with you when you wander. God is with you when you're arrogant. And now we come to the climax of the passage. Verse 15. Then Laban said to Jacob, because you're my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. And Jacob loved Rachel after a month. He's only been there a month, but zealous guy. Okay, whatever. And he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife that I may go into her for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob and he went into her. Oh my goodness, what's gonna happen? And we build the suspense. Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant, almost like a commercial, building the suspense. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. Now, come on. How did Jacob not know? I know some of you are thinking it. I've thought it too. How? Come on, Jacob. How could you not know? It was dark. They wore veils. And Laban made a huge feast. You know what was at the feast? Alcohol. Lots of it. Gets Jacob all liquored up. And bam. Here you go. Here's your wife. Gotcha. Behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then, did you, why then have you deceived me? Laban said, it is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one and we'll give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter, Rachel, to be his wife. Again, as we've talked about in the past, this is not prescriptive, but rather descriptive. This is not telling you, yep, go and get that second wife. Problems come when there's multiple wives. Huge problems, we'll see. Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban for another seven years. Final thing, God is with you when you are disciplined. God is with you when you are disciplined. Here Jacob is betrayed. Why have you betrayed me? Why have you deceived me? And without context, oh, poor Jacob. That bad Laban, poor Jacob. No, <laughs> he's getting a taste of his own medicine. The deceiver has been deceived. This is just like how he betrayed Isaac. He went in, he covered himself with hair, he brought food. Ah, uh, yes, I am your son Esau. And he takes the blessing away. And now here he is, and he is getting deceived. Now it shows that 
even though God's plan was accomplished through that betrayal, through that deception, God did not approve of it. Here, God is teaching Jacob a lesson. The dream was the first time where God made himself clear to, I, to, to Jacob. Hey, I'm here. And then here, God is teaching Jacob something. He's shaking, shaping Jacob more and continues to do so. Now, we all like the bad guys getting a taste of their own medicine. Ha <laughs> ha, Jacob, you got what's coming to you. But remember where we started this morning? <laughs> On our own, we're all the bad guy. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us needs discipline. Look up at the screen, Hebrews chapter 12. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Jacob was not happy, needless to say. He hated what he was dealing with. But God was working on Jacob. God loved Jacob enough to allow him to go through this. God shapes and molds each and every one of us. And as a loving potter works with clay, God molds and shapes us to become more like him. And sometimes that process is difficult and painful because it takes a little bit of squeezing and pushing to get things right. And sometimes when we're really not listening and we continue to head in the right way, it takes some pain and some difficulty for God to get through to us. For God to say, no, don't go that direction. There's nothing but pain and trouble ahead. I've got something better for you. No, that's not what I want for you. That's not how you're supposed to be living your life. Stop and go in this direction. As C.S. Lewis said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts to us in our pains. It is God's megaphone to arouse a deaf world. And so if you're experiencing pain right now, if you're experiencing hardship, maybe that's God trying to get through to you and say, I want you, I need you, I desire you. Will you stop what you're doing and pay attention to me? God does it because he loves us so desperately, so passionately, and he wants the best for us. God puts Jacob through something awful because he loves Jacob and wants the best. This is the beauty of the gospel. This is a God who never gives up on us. We're about to sing. Are you hurting? And desires a beautiful relationship with you. And sometimes he has to discipline us to make us more like him. But it is his way of loving us so passionately so desperately 
because he wants us to become more like him. God, thank you for loving us that way. Thank you for never giving up on us, for continuing to pursue us, for doing exactly what we need to get our attention and to draw us to you. God, may we listen intently. May we pay attention to what you're doing and to rest in the fact that you are with us, that you always are gonna come through on your promises. For that we are thankful and in that we rest today, God. In Jesus' name, amen.